So to pick up from where I had stopped, what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you look at the spinal cord, you'll realize that it has first what encloses it in the name of a vertebral column or the backbone. And I've said from the base of the brain to the far end or to the posterior end of the spinal cord, we have a total of 33 bones. These bones get distributed in five main regions. We have what you call the cervical region, we have what you call the thoracic region, just below it, we have what you call the lumbar region, then we have what you call the sacral region. And at the end part of it, we have what you call the coccygeal or the coccyx. So if you look at these five regions, each and every region has a certain number of bones. If you look at the cervical region, it has a total of seven bones. If you look at the thoracic region, it has a total of 12 bones. So have you actually named those bones moving from the cervical to the coccyx? You realize at the end of the day, you'll have a total of 33 bones. Moving to the inside, the spinal cord again gets protected or surrounded by three meninges. These are the dura to the outside, the pia, which is the innermost, and the arachnoid, which is a small space between the dura and the pia, filled by what you call the cerebrospinal fluid. As you move to the inside of the spinal cord, we have what you call the gray matter and the white matter. The gray matter is H-shaped and at the center of the spinal cord. The white matter surrounds the gray matter. If you look at the gray matter, the upper part of the gray matter is actually referred to as a dorsal fissure. Dorsal fissure. Dorsal fissure. Dorsal, then F I double S U R E. At the lower part of the spinal cord, where we have what you call the gray matter, we have this part called ventral fissure. Ventral fissure. Ventral, then fissure. F I double S U R E. Now, at the upper part, we have again the gray matter having what you call the dorsal horn and the ventral horn at the lower part. If you look again at the spinal cord, we have what you call the central canal at the center of the gray matter. The central canal is filled by what you call cerebrospinal fluid. That is just a simple description of how the spinal cord looks like. If you look again at the spinal cord, you'll realize that the spinal cord receives nourishment in actually having oxygen and nutrients getting supplied to it from the cerebral spinal fluid, which is actually a continuation of the cerebral spinal fluid found in the brain. As I move downwards, if I may have a diagram showing how nerves enter and leave the spinal cord on my left and as far as that diagram will be concerned now that you'll actually be able to have that diagram when you'll be looking at this discussion i'm actually having here you'll realize that on my left through the dorsal horn we have what you call the spinal nerve entering the spinal cord that path followed by that spinal nerve entering the spinal cord through the dorsal root and the dorsal horn we have what you call dorsal root ganglion. Dorsal root ganglion. Again, at the same time, the spinal nerve leaves the spinal cord. Again, through what you call the ventral root and ventral horn. On my right, if you look at the spinal cord, you shall have this one. The sensory nerve from the receptor organ that receives the stimuli or stimulus in singular enters the spinal cord through what you call the dorsal root again and the dorsal horn. Again, the sensory nerve or sensory neuron is able to get connected to the relay neuron through what we call a synapse or a neurojunction. A relay neuron is majorly found in the gray matter. Again, the relay neuron gets connected to the motor neuron, now going to the effector organs, through what we call a synapse or a neurojunction. If you look at the gray matter, it has a dark appearance. Why? Because it is actually able to have what you call the dendrites and the cell bodies or the syndromes of the relay neuron and the motor neuron. If you look at the white matter, why does it have a shiny white appearance? 
in as far as the word the the name has actually been able to get given it is because the axons of the motor and sensory neurons have what you call the myelin sheath or a medulated sheath this myelin sheath or medullary sheath will give the axons or will actually be able to give this region its shiny white appearance the axons of the sensory neuron and the motor neuron are myelinated being myelinated means that now they will end up giving this region a shiny white appearance moving forward you will realize that when you look at the spinal cord you will understand that it is actually able to form part of what you call the central nervous system so the spinal cord with the nerves it has called the cranial nerves and other nerves innervating each and every part of the body together the cranial nerves control each and every biological activity and regulate each and every function in each and every part below the head that means that now if someone breaks your spinal cord you end up becoming paralyzed why because any nervous communication any coordination any reception coordination and response has to actually get affected by the central nervous system and the spinal cord forms part of the central nervous system the brain has three membranes covering it first to even go to this point you'll understand that the outermost part of the brain is actually called the skull the bony structure in which the brain gets embedded in is called the cranium or the skull just below the cranium or the skull now closer to the brain to the inside we have what you call the three meninges the dura that's the outermost and the toughest part that covers the brain from outside it has connective tissues and blood capillaries to the innermost part of the brain now the innermost membrane that covers the brain we have what you call the pia it is what you call blood capillaries that nourishes each and every part of the brain and as well lymph vessels the lymph vessels drain away excess tissue fluid the lymph vessels drain away the excess cerebrospinal fluid in case a person does not actually have these lymph vessels well developed the person may end up having most of the cerebrospinal fluid getting retained in the brain and in that process you will realize that the person develops a disease called hydrocephalus where the person ends up having an oversized head why because the fluid called cerebrospinal fluid has been retained in the brain cells to ensure that the cerebrospinal fluid remains a very important part of the brain and forms part and parcel of the nourishment of the brain you will realize that there are avenues called ventricles in each and every part of the brain these ventricles ensure that each and every part of the brain receives the cerebrospinal fluid why because the cerebrospinal fluid has what you call nutrients and oxygen that the brain cells require for their metabolic activities so that means that now the ventricles have to be there so that they actually give avenue or avenues so that each and every part of the brain gets nourished by the cerebrospinal fluid that has nutrients and oxygen to move forward you will understand that when you look at this spinal cord you will realize that together with the brain and the cranial nerves that get concentrated in the brain and the neck region and the spinal nerves that form part of each and every part of the body you will realize that all these parts are responsible for reception coordination and response going forward you will understand that if you look at the structure of a nerve cell or a neuron a nerve cell first has two major parts we have what you call the dendron and the cell body that means if you look at the nerve cell or the neuron the central aileron mentioned or the cell body and the dendrites are able to collectively form what you call a nerve cell a nerve cell is actually the basic the main the basic 
functional unit of a nervous system. The main or the basic functional unit of a nervous system. That means without an absolute neuron, nervous communication cannot take place. So the basic or the main function unit of a nervous system is called a nerve cell or a neuron. A nerve cell has two main parts. It has what you call the centron or the cell body and then the dendrites. And you'll understand that one of the dendrites get elongated. One of the dendrites get elongated to form what you call the axon. The axon has an outer membrane called plasma membrane that encloses it. To the far end, we have what you call the myelin sheath or medullated sheath, which is actually a fatty sheath that encloses the axon. To the outside, as you move to the outside of the neu neu neuron or the nerve cell, you'll have what you call the neurilemma. The neurilemma has cells called situani cell. How do you spell neurilemma? N E U R I L E double M A neurilemma. A membrane of the strand cell. How do you spell strand cell? S C H W A double N strand cell. The strand cell secretes the myelin sheath, which is a fatty sheath, also called medullated sheath. Moving forward, you'll understand that the location or the position of the cell body or centron will actually be able to give us three different types of neurons that we shall discuss later. The myelin sheath insulates the axon or prevents the axon from excess heat loss. The myelin sheath has breakages, has actually been able to get broken at intervals of one millimeter to form what you call nodes of Ranvia. Nodes of Ranvia help to propagate nerve impulses and increase or speed up nerve impulse transmission. So, the myelin sheath is broken at intervals of one millimeter to form nodes of Ranvia. Nodes of Ranvia. The nodes of Ranvia help to propagate nerve impulses or to speed nerve impulse transmission. Moving forward, you'll understand that. When you look at, for example, a nerve cell, it has two different types of dendrites. We have receptor dendrites and terminal dendrites. Receptor dendrites are the dendrites that are able to get connected to the receptor organs or they get connected to the terminal dendrites of the dozen neuron when you look at terminal dendrites they are dendrites that get linked to the effector organs or receptor dendrites of the neighboring neuron moving forward we have three main categories of neurons or nerve cells the main, the main category the second category and the third category, we have what you call the unipolar, the bipolar, and multipolar. A unipolar neuron is a neuron that has only one dendrite projecting from the cell body. A bipolar neuron is that neuron that has two dendrites projecting from the cell body. A multipolar neuron is actually a neuron that has many dendrites projecting from the cell body. For example, if you look at these neurons or nerve cells, you'll understand how this is actually going to work. There are three main types of neurons. We have what you call sensory neuron, we have what you call motor neuron, and we have what you call relay neuron. Sensor neuron. If you look at the sensor neuron, you'll find each cell body located off the axon. Each cell body located off the axon. We only have one dendrite projecting from the cell body of a sensory neuron. The receptor dendrites of a sensory neuron are linked to the receptor organs. The terminal dendrites of a sensory neuron are actually located in the central nervous system. If you look at a motor neuron, this motor neuron links the central nervous system and the effector organs. If you look at the sensory neuron, it links the receptor organs and the sensory part of the brain, or what you call the central nervous system. That means that the information from any receptor organ, like the ear, the eye, the skin, 
can only be able to get taken to the central nervous system through what we call the sensory neuron. That same same information after interpretation can be able to get relayed to the motor neuron through what you call the relay neuron. So that means looking at a motor neuron, it is able to link the central nervous system and the effector organs. Looking at a motor neuron, it has the following parts. Number one, it has its receptor dendrites in the central nervous system. It has its terminal dendrites in the effector organs, like the muscles and the glands. If you look at a motor neuron, its cell body is actually located in the central nervous system. If you look at a motor neuron, it has several dendrites projecting from its cell body or central. If you look at a relay neuron, it's a neuron that can either be unipolar, multipolar, or bipolar. But to be very specific, it is majorly multipolar or bipolar. That means it can have two dendrites projecting from each cell body, or it can have several dendrites projecting from each cell body. Really, neuron is not myelinated. It has no myelin sheath. It has no medulated sheath. That means it actually just ensures that it connects or links the sensor neuron and the motor neuron through what you call a synapse or neural junction. What do I mean here? That means that now, when a message comes from the receptor organ and has to be taken to the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, that information has to pass through the sensory neuron. That information undergoes what you call coordination or interpretation by the brain. The information has to be relayed to the motor neuron to get taken to the effector organ through what you call the relay neuron, through what you call a synapse or a neural junction. Moving forward, you'll understand that the sensory neuron, the relay neuron, the motor neuron will actually be able to form what you call the nervous communication. The nervous communication. The nervous communication. The nervous communication. Moving forward, you will understand that. You will understand that. There are two different types of reflex actions. What is a reflex action first? A reflex action is a rapid and automatic response to a certain stimulus. You get your finger getting pricked. Do you actually get pricked by a sharp object? And you just sit there and start looking and laughing at it. Oh, I'm, I'm pricked. No. If a finger gets pricked, the hand gets withdrawn. A rapid and automatic response to a stimulus. What happens here? This means that now you are supposed to ensure that you understand the meaning of a reflex action. It's a rapid and automatic response to a certain stimulus. A rapid and automatic response to a certain stimulus. Look at this. If this is a rapid and automatic response to a certain stimulus, we can categorize reflex actions into two, two main categories. Category number one, we have what you call symbol reflex action. Number two, we have what you call conditioned reflex action. In a simple reflex action, it is just a specific, single, and automatic response to a certain stimulus. A specific, single, and automatic response to a certain stimulus. I can use this example. If a finger gets pricked, I'll respond by withdrawing my hand. That means that's an example of a simple reflex action a specific, single, and automatic response to a certain external stimulus. How do I respond? By withdrawing my hand. How many stimuli do we have bring about that response? It's only one stimulus. That is actually the pricking of the finger by a sharp object or a hot object. Moving forward, you'll understand that when I have to mention examples of simple reflex actions. You'll be able to understand what I mean. Number one, other examples apart from withdrawing a hand that has a finger getting pricked by a sharp object or a hot object. We have swallowing. You don't prepare to swallow. You just find yourself swallowing. You tell people that I want now to swallow. No. That's a simple reflex action. Salivating. Do you tell people that now I want to swallow my saliva? No. Or my saliva is dropping because I've seen some food somewhere. No. So salivating. Swallowing. Coughing. Do you tell someone that I'm going to cough in the next two minutes? No. You find yourself just coughing. Single, 
systematic, specific, and automatic word. Response. Sneezing. I will not prepare to sneeze. I will just sneeze. Now, when you blink your eyes when an object passes closer to your eyes, that's another example of a simple reflex action. When you cut onions, you find yourself just shedding tears. That's a simple reflex action. These are just some of the examples you're supposed to capture in as far as a simple reflex action is concerned. Simple reflex action does not depend on learning. Do you learn to how <coughs> coughing is supposed to be done? Simple reflex actions don't depend on learning. You don't need to prepare to actually have a lesson that can help you to know how to cough or sneeze or shed tears. This one, again, the simple reflex action does not depend on past experience. You don't need to actually have an experience in coughing so that you can even cough better. No. So, simple reflex action does not depend on learning, does not depend on past experience. Single, specific and automatic response to a certain external stimulus. Moving forward, we have what you call conditioned reflex action. Conditioned reflex action is actually evoking a response from an animal by an unrelated stimulus substituted for the one that normally elicits the response. Evoke a response from an animal by an unrelated stimulus substituted for the one that normally evokes the response. For example, if I have a dog somewhere in my compound and then I present food to the dog. What happens to the dog? The dog salivates. Now, I can take a bell and start ringing before I present the food. After some time, with the several experiments getting carried out, the dog will actually get conditioned to salivate when the bell is rung even in the absence of the food. That means I've evoked a response from an animal by an unrelated stimulus. A bell, for heaven's sake, cannot make you to salivate. But I'm evoking a response from an animal by using a stimulus which is unrelated, normally substituted for the one that normally elicits the response. So a bell has been substituted. And in that case, you'll find that when the food gets presented, the bell has nothing to actually work. The dog salivates. When the food gets substituted by the bell and the bell gets rung, what happens? The dog again salivates in the absence of the food. Now, these experiments were carried out by a scientist called Ivan Pavlov. He carried out experiments and he realized that after some time, after some experiments, the dog could learn to salivate when the bell could be rung, even in the absence of the food. These things are very important to actually have students getting trained on one, number one, writing, swimming, reading, and other areas like cycling. These experiments, in as far as conditioned reflex action is concerned, have been able to get carried out and being very important, have been able to get applied in the following areas. For example, advertisements, training dogs, and learning processes. What are the differences between simple reflex action and conditioned reflex action? Number one, simple reflex action requires a single stimulus to evoke a response. Conditioned reflex action requires repeated stimulus to evoke a response. The second difference, you realize that simple reflex action does not depend on experience and there's no modification of behavior. I cannot be able to get modified, modified coughing. I can't modify my coughing. I can't modify my sneezing. Conditioned reflex action involves modification of behavior and actually relies on past experience. 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 Now, to actually finish these things, to actually finish these things, you'll understand that if you look at again simple reflex action and conditioned reflex action, conditioned reflex action relies on the basis of reinforcement, reinforcement by actually repeating the previous experience or repeating the previous stimulus previously presented to the animal. So it relies on past experience.
relies on past experience. So to ensure that the same same behavior can be able to get shown in that environment, then it means that now the reinforcement aspect must be able to get presented. The reinforcement aspect must get be must be able to get present presented. Must be able to get presented. Must be able to get presented. Must be able to get pre presented. Must be able to get presented. If you look at a simple reflex action, you don't need to have what you call reinforcement. I don't need to get reinforced before I can be able to cough or sneeze. Do I get to get reinforced? Like I'm given a sweet, then I'm told, can you cough? No. So, simple reflex action, like you want to cough, does not need any reinforcement. That's very, 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 very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. I want to look at the way the ear of an animal, like a human being, is adapted to perform its functions in the next few minutes. Number one, the ear has three main parts. We have what you call the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear is made up of the ear pinna, that flap of the skin that actually looks like a bean. We have what you call the external auditory meatus, that pipe that directs the sound waves to the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. So, from outside, when I begin with the outer ear, we have what you call the ear pinna, that flap of the skin that is actually able to offer a light surface area. It offers a light surface area in a way that now it collects all the sound waves. It collects all the sound waves and actually directs them to the tympanic membrane. The ear pinna, a flap of the skin, provides a light surface area to collect all the sound waves and direct them to the tympanic membrane. From the ear pinna, that flap of skin, we have what you call the external auditory meatus, that pipe, that opening, that avenue, that now there is the sound waves to the inner parts of the ear. When you look at the piping, when you look at the external auditory meatus, it ensures that all the sound waves collected by the ear pinna are actually directed to the tympanic membrane. Again, along the external auditory meatus, we have what you call wax secreting cells. The wax secreting cells secrete wax. The wax traps dust particles to prevent the dust particles from finding their way into the inner parts of the ear. Again, along the external auditory meatus, we have what you call the hairs. The hairs also trap dust particles to prevent any dust particles from entering and actually affecting the inner parts of the, of the ear. The next part is the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is actually also called the eardrum. It's actually double layered with connective tissues. It gets hit by sound waves and starts vibrating. That means it converts the sound waves into vibrations. Then directs the sound waves or the vibrations to what you call the ear ossicles. We have three main ear ossicles. We have what you call malleus, incus, and stapes. These three ear ossicles are arranged at right angles to each other so that the vibrations are able to get amplified before they can actually be able to reach the other parts of the ear. When I start talking about the eardrum and the ear ossicles, I'm actually talking about the middle ear. So, the eardrum or the tympanic membrane gets hit by the sound waves. It starts vibrating. It converts the vibrations or it converts the sound waves into vibrations. Those vibrations are transferred to the three ear ossicles, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The malleus, incus, and the stapes are the bones also arranged at right angles to each other to ensure that these sound waves or these vibrations are again amplified. From there, you should note this. Malleus, incus, and stapes are the three bones. These three bones are held in positions, are held in positions by muscles called tensor, tympani, and stapedas. Tensor, T-E-N-S-O-R, tympani, T-Y-M-P-A-N-I, and stapedas, S-T-A-P-E-D-U-S, are the muscles that hold these three bones in position to avoid any form of damage when they actually end up getting hit by a larger or actually sound waves with a greater magnification. 
That means Malias, Incas, and Stapes are the three bony structures positioned at right angles to each other so that the sound waves can be amplified. These three bones are held in position by muscles called stapedas, tensor, and tympan. You see? Moving forward, you should understand this. The work secreted by the work secreting, secreting cells along or actually within that region of the external auditory meatus also ensures that the tympanic membrane or what you call the eardrum is made flexible flexible it can easily vibrate it can easily turn the sound waves into vibrations from there the sound waves are actually able to get directed to the inner ear in a region called the cochlea through what you call the oval window these sound waves on heating the oval window, get directed now to the cochlea, the inner ear. The cochlea has two fluids, endolymph to the inside and perilymph to the outside. When these fluids are able to receive the vibrations, they actually start moving within the cochlea. In that process, the sensory hairs are actually triggered to actually have a nervous communication getting taken now to the auditory meatus. If you have what you call the periliver, the endoliver, the fluids in the cochlea, the sound waves from the oval window reaching the cochlea make the fluids within the cochlea to start also moving. And as the fluids move, what happens here? These fluids stimulate the sensor hairs on the cochlea to actually generate a nerve impulse. That nerve impulse is carried by the auditory nerve. The auditory nerve can carry that nerve impulse to the brain for interpretation. And after that one, the sound can be perceived like that. Very, very important. Very, very important. Now, moving forward, moving forward, you'll understand that the vibrations again from the endolymph and the perilymph are get taken back to the middle ear through what you call the round window. Also called what? Fenestra rotunda. The sound waves reach the cochlea through what you call fenestra ovalis. The sound waves get back to the middle ear through what you call fenestra rotunda or round window. Very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. Now I'm supposed to be somewhere. Can we stop there? I think I'll get back to you in the evening. May God bless you so much. Have a nice day. Please remember to send the money. Thank you so much and have a nice day.